Right, today I'm in Bath with author Jamie Reid, uh, well known for Doped and uh, most recently Monster X. Uh, thank you very much for agreeing to talk to us today, Jamie. Absolute pleasure. Uh, you appear to be attracted to the dark side of life. Where do your choices of stories to cover come from? Well, you're right, actually, Simon. I've always been fascinated by characters who are a bit ambiguous, who I would say are not wholly good, but they're not necessarily wholly bad either. I think that uh, stories of people who, it's a bit like the series Peaky Blinders, where one of the actresses in that, Helen McCrory, said the great thing about those characters, those gangsters in Birmingham in the 20s, is that they, they want to be the heroes of their own lives, and they're prepared to take risks and, and walk on both sides of the street to achieve it. And I find stories like that more interesting than, than just sort of nourishing tales of, um, of, of, of clean cut, Heroes. I, I, I do find myself quite drawn to the, to the low life and the, and, and the gangster world. And most recently, you've written a book based in France, in the, in the wartime Cologne, being the example I was thinking of. Um, there's a shocking passage in there where John Goldsmith, the hero of the hour, executes the mother of a Gestapo's chief mistress. Um, that's usually the domain of the bad guys. How do you ferret out such facts and how does it sit with you? that you sort of resurrect them? Well, he, Goldsmith was completely honest about it, and he, he mentions that in his own memoir, Accidental Agent, which is the book that the horse that his granddaughter, E. Johnson Horton, uh, trained, named after him, that won the Queen Anne Stakes at World Ascot the other day. Um, but I think the fascinating thing about that SOE experience and part of our history is that it took people from all walks of life and in John Goldsmith's case he was a racehorse trainer and they weren't necessarily your typical kind of James Bond like figures or your typical MI6 spies but the SOE training it taught them how to lie, deceive, steal, commit acts of arson and sabotage and if necessary kill for their king and country. And I think John Goldsmith, he was prepared to do it. He realized that if he was going to do this, his own life and the success of his missions depended on doing it 100%. And we have to remember the extraordinary and unique circumstances that they found themselves in, fighting people like the Nazis in occupied France. The, the, the woman who he murdered or he killed was the wife of a brutal Gestapo officer. And it was a reprisal that the resistance had decided on for the murders of numerous of their own members. So, you know, put ourselves, we've never had to put ourselves in our lifetime in a situation like that. He found himself in that situation and he went with it 100%. What fascinates me about it is that he then came back and took on the bookmakers in England in the 40s and 50s. And even though he didn't kill anybody at Lincoln or Aintree or wherever, he was certainly ruthless when the money was down and he had a gamble. In any of your no, uh, any, not novels, any of your books that you've written, have you discovered anything during your research that you thought, uh, that would really not bring that one back? I think that there are always areas where you wonder whether you should refer to certain things if there are children or grandchildren still alive who would be hurt or upset by certain things. When I was doing Doped, um, I reached a kind of tacit agreement with the relations of Micheline Lujan, Bill Roper's girlfriend, that I wouldn't reveal what had happened to her at the end of her life. And in fact, I did have information about that, and it's intriguing. And the only thing I'll say now is that she's still alive, um, but she doesn't live in Britain. Um, but I realized that, that there was an understanding there. They were prepared to share with me quite a lot of, of her life and stories and information nobody else had ever uh, 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 been able to get access to. So I was prepared to, to honor that side of the bargain. Um, I think that's probably the closest I've come to that. Okay, you become successful as a writer by writing about your passion, which is, amongst other things, horse racing, and you know, you, you've latched onto the senior side of it. Yeah. What was the beginning, how did you, the beginning of your interest, uh, what was the catalyst for it? Well, I should say actually, although the, 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 the books are about tales of um, people, as I said, who, who sort of walk on both sides of the street, in the sunlight, in the shade, 
I've always loved racing for the beauty and spectacle of racing. I'm a 100% fan of fabulous jockeys, fabulous horses, magnificent trainers, um, whether it be watching Frankel, um, who I thought was the most beautiful, glorious racehorse. I remember being at Epsom the day Galileo won the derby and the great gambler Barney Curley was standing next to me and he, in the way everybody will know, Barney measures his words very carefully. And he asked me what I fancied and I said I'd back Galileo and he just, he didn't say anything and then he leaned over at the last minute and he said, this is going to be the easiest derby winner you've ever seen. And I remember how, how I loved watching Mick Kinnan on that horse cruising through the race. Going back to when I was a child, I remember watching on television horses like Mill Reef, Nijinsky, who I idolised with Lester Piggott, and it went right back to watching TV and watching Arkell and Mill House. Um, that first Gold Cup when they met was on a Saturday that year, unusually in 1964. And I was a fan of Mill House. He was a bit like Denman Mill House. He was this big tank of a horse, and I didn't think he could be beaten. And then Arkell, this fantastic kind of sports car, this Ferrari of a racehorse, turned him over and I hero worshipped Arkham. So I, I loved the spectacle and beauty of it. I had a grandmother, gambling mad grandmother, my mother's mother, who'd been a, a backer of racehorses all her life. She always had the racing papers in her house. She took me as a child to places like Epsom and the gaffs in South East England, like Lewis and Y. and she took me to Brighton. She loved flat racing, actually, a bit more than jumping. But at where she lived in Edenbridge, next door to her, they, they had the old Surrey and Burstow point to point. And the point to point committee were always very uh, appreciative of, of using a bit of her land. And I used to go to the point to points with her and my parents, and I loved being up close to the horses. I loved walking around the betting ring. And then I remember going with Grandma to Epsom when I was about 10 or 11. And bookmakers at that time were always represented in films and the old Ealing movies as spivvy gents with little bow ties, spotted bow ties and loud check suits. And a lot of the bookmakers at Epsom, they didn't look like that at all. They were in tailor-made suits, they were in beautiful handmade shirts, smart hats, they had style. And I loved the smell of the crushed grass, the cigar smoke, the reddies, the bundles of cash they had. And I just remember thinking, I can't get enough of this. This, this, is, this is where I want to be. When did you decide, or when did it start that you sort of put all your experiences down on paper? When were, when were your writing skills honed? Yeah, it, it, didn't, it didn't come straight away. Um, I had an experience of working in the theatre actually when I, when I, when I was um, much younger. And then in 19, uh, what was it, 1985, I wrote a novel uh, called Easy Money where um, a publisher, an independent publisher, um, had encouraged me to try and do a racing thriller because there was only really Dick Francis at the time. There weren't the, the, the John Frankham or the, the Jenny Pittman books or whatever. And I thought from what I'd seen of the race course that not everybody was a clean cut gentleman and hero and amateur rider like in the Dick Francis stories. And that although I enjoyed them, I thought there was room for something a bit more, a bit darker, a bit more like, you know, the Americans would say, a bit more noirish, film noir type characters. So I wrote a novel that was a bit over the top, really, about a, a bookie come gangster from Glasgow um, and his activities and his lovers. And Julian Wilson reviewed it on television for the BBC and he said, rather po faced, he said, Now we come to a book in which the hero is a gambler who sleeps with prostitutes, snorts cocaine, and drinks vodka for breakfast. And Wisland was obviously rather disapproving of this, but it did wonders for sales, is all I can say. So I sort of started with that one. That was 1985. Um, you said also to be a lifelong hunter during your, uh, your career. Have you beaten the bookies? I have on certain races. My first ever bet, which is funny to remember again, was courtesy of Grandma, was a shilling each way on Pardeo in the Derby in 1961. And he came third at something like about seven or eight to one, I think, so that wasn't too bad a start. Um, I got into betting a lot when I was in my 20s, and in my 30s, I used to hang around a lot with a great old friend of mine, Mel Smith, the comic, who sadly died a few years ago. And Mel was a great racing fanatic and a great punter. And he was a good judge of form when he was younger. His dad, Ken, had three betting shops in West London. 
and Ken used to find Mel's old betting slips in his trouser pockets and the pockets of his suit. And he'd say, you idiot, you know, what are you doing having 30, 50 pounds on a racehorse? That's how I make my living. But we disregarded Ken's advice and we used to bet pretty crazily, to be honest. Um, but we had our days. I remember Cheltenham 1981, uh, the first day of the festival, we had the first four winners. And they included a great Mick O'Toole gamble in the first on a horse called Hartstown and then Clayside in the Arkle, which was a good price. And then we backed Sea Pigeon, and I told Mel, we have to back Sea Pigeon, even though he's the veteran, the rest of them aren't good enough, they're not his class. And Johnny Franken gave him one of the great rides we will ever remember, all of us who were there, and it won. And then Derring Rose won the stay as well. So they were good days. Later on, as the years went by, I liked getting into anti-post betting in the days when it was, when it was um, the sort of 80s, you didn't have the amount of analysis of horse racing you have now. You didn't have as many people doing form guides. You didn't have as many trends being picked out in newspapers. And I like looking to see the kind of trainers and owners who laid out certain horses for those races at Cheltenham year after year. And I tried following that pattern in other big races like the Prix de l'Arc de Triomphe. And I had some great days at Cheltenham like that with, with, with trainers like Edward O'Grady from Ireland, Mick O'Toole um, and I remember I think in more recent years well I had a fantastic win at Cheltenham with Christy Roach's mare like a butterfly when she won the Supreme Novices which was the year after the foot and mouth and then I went and stuck all my winnings on Rhinestone Cowboy, John Joe's bumper horse in the bumper the next day and you may remember he just got touched off by Pizarro trained by O'Grady and I thought that Rhinestone Cowboy would get the race on the stewards' inquiry, and he didn't. So that was a blow. But one of the best wins I've had in the last decade was when, uh, it was more than that now, was it? When Railing won the Prix de l'Arc de Triomphe. Andre Favre, and Andre Favre improving three year old, going for the Prix de l'Arc de Triomphe, won the Grand Prix de Paris. I loved him, everything about him. And the exchanges had him up to about 80 to 1 in June or July of that year. And I had little bits on him all the way through and up to when he ran in the Prix Niel. And that was one of the biggest wins I've had. But I've given the bookmakers back a lot more money than I've won. And, and it, it got me into a lot of trouble with betting at one point in, 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 into the late 80s, into the 90s. I, I, I got into some fairly hair-raising places. So um, I try and be, be, be a bit more cautious about it nowadays. Now the people watching at home are going to say, can you elaborate a bit on how hair-raising? <laughs> well, you know, it, it's, it's, I think the whole thing about gambling. If you're a real punter, you will recognize and understood a punter. And you know that it's not really, it isn't special unless you place yourself slightly in a position of jeopardy. It's got to be, it's got to be more than you can afford to lose. It's got to have that element to it. And the excitement and thrill, hopefully, you get from winning outweighs the pain you get from losing. And as long as it's that way around, then I guess it's okay. Then it's a kick that you keep sticking with. But, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I've had the losers, I can assure you.